My name is Ian Angstrand. I'm a partner here in Boston in the technology company's practice group. My practice does focus uh, largely on M&A. And uh, whenever I enter into an M&A, what makes a really, really good deal is uh, one, a very well-functioning board, a board that communicates with each other and gets along. Uh, two, uh, investor alignment. In, in any given deal, uh, they, they, there could be disparate interests, uh, different constituencies want different things out of it, and, and different constituencies get different purchase prices in, in many deals. So when uh, there's a general investor alignment, that uh, makes getting the deal done much easier. And then probably third is, is management alignment. Um, oftentimes in a deal, management might um, have different feelings about the deal than the investors. Uh, management may like the buyer, may want to work for the buyer. Uh, on the flip side, management may be lukewarm on the buyer and it, it's in their interests uh, to, to not see the deal go through. So when, uh, when all three of those align, uh, good functioning board, uh, good investors that are aligned in the deal and management excitement and alignment for the deal, that, that's a good M&A. By the time you get a buyer and a term sheet on the table, your IP kind of is what it is. Uh, you either have taken care of it all along or you haven't. I think one way to safeguard it against um, maybe uh, disclosing it to the buyer too early in the process is to stage uh, when you disclose. So you open the data room, uh, you uh, leak out some of your M&A into the data room and the buyer does its diligence and then you know once you get the buyer comes along and it becomes more serious and you get uh, to see the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel, then, then you, you open it up a little bit more and you show them the, the buyer a little bit more and then you know hopefully at the end of the deal you've shown them everything and um, you know you're ready to sign the deal. A lot of these big buyers are so large that um, the revenue is not as important as the technology that they're buying and, and the teams. I think the teams have continued to be uh, probably the most important asset. Tech Life Science M&A is different from some M&A in that you know a lot of the M&A is done uh, not as a revenue buy, but as a, a product buy and technology buy. So um, you know the, the markets may be up or down, um, and I think tech M&A is in, in a lot of senses uh, resistant to to market swings. You know a lot of the big tech buyers have huge. Uh, huge positions of cash on their balance sheet, and even if the market is is you know not doing as well as it has been in, in years, you know they still have to go and spend that money, and they spend it by buying companies largely. So again, you know the market may be down, but in my practice at least, I still see M and A humming along. I expect it to continue. I mean, I think um, technology is not going anywhere, and there's really good companies that are growing faster than the very large companies with the cash. So uh, those two variables equal more M&A. I like working with founders. Uh, the, the founders who are continuing with the company from day one through the sale, um, that's what gets me excited. Uh, they're, they're the most exciting people at the company. They generally have the most to gain and the most to lose, if uh, depending on the outcome. And uh, they're, in my experience, they're the most kind of dynamic and invested people there.